Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Let's begin today's analysis of the Hindu newspaper with the first article that is written here on the 25th year anniversary of the Bimstick. The Bimstick group, as I am sure all of you would have heard about, stands for the Bay of Bengal Initiative for the Multi-Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation. Now the unfortunate and a bit interesting part is that you might not have heard about this group if you actually go back to let's say 6 or 7 years. It is only in the past 7 or 8 years that we have been hearing about Bimstick in different aspects. However, the reality is that it has been in existence for 25 years now. Meaning that it was in 1997 that the group was first formed. Although there were only four members that were the initial members of this group. That is Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka and Thailand. And now this group has grown into membership and other members such as Nepal, Bhutan and Myanmar have also joined it. The good part for India is that in the past few years we have seen that this group has now been given a lot more importance as compared to others and not just by India but by other member states also. The author here is saying that on the 25th year anniversary we must realize the importance of BIMSTEC. We must realize the fact that India can use this platform for a lot of aspects. That includes getting a hold of the leadership position in the South Asia region. Also forming much better relations with South East Asia because Thailand is a common partner both in BIMSTEC and in the ASEAN nations also and also ensuring that we can counter the spread and the influence of China in this region. But for that to happen, a lot more steps have to be taken in this regard. The author here is pointing out towards some of the achievements and a lot of failures with respect to BIMSTEC's existence in the past 25 years. For example, some of the achievements include the ones that happened recently. As you know, recently, a few months back, there was the BIMSTEC summit in Sri Lanka's Colombo. This was only the fifth summit of BIMSTEC. And now you can understand the group that has been existing since 1997 just had its fifth summit now in 2022. Meaning that the nations who are members of BIMSTEC have been quite irregular and have not given it the due importance. It was in this summit that the nations came up with a new charter to give priority to all the sectors of cooperation. Earlier, there were 14 different sectors of cooperation and 14 was one too many. See, when you have so many areas of cooperation or when you have so many things that you want to focus on, the fact remains that you won't be able to focus on any of them. That is why the intelligent thing that the nations did was they cut out 14 into 7 only. So now there are seven areas of cooperation and each member nation, there are seven member nations, so each of them have been given the responsibility to lead one aspect of this group. Also, the nations together have now been working to strengthen their secretariat, which is in Dhaka, Bangladesh. The nations have also decided that we should give a push to common connectivity. That can be a big, big thing for the future. Because the good part is that most of the BIMSTEC nations are actually connected and there can be one common road or rail connectivity in the entire region barring a few such as Sri Lanka and we must take advantage of that. These were the important achievements that BIMSTEC has shown till now. Now come to the failure part of it. The single biggest failure is that it has been 18 years since the nations last talked about a framework agreement for a free trade agreement. But even today, there is no talk of any free trade agreement amongst the member nations of BIMSTEC. Now, there are a lot of reasons for it. One reason is whenever you have a group where one or two nations are much, much bigger than the others, which is the case here. See, India's size, India's economy, India's GDP is head and shoulders above almost all the member nations in BIMSTEC. In such a situation, the smaller nations have a feeling that they don't want to sign such an agreement because the bigger nation would be at an advantage and the bigger nation will be able to put a lot of pressure in their market and they will exploit their market. In such a scenario, it becomes the responsibility of the bigger nation to try and convince the smaller nations, which India has not been able to do. Other disappointment is about connectivity. We talk a lot about building common connectivity as we just did in terms of roads, railways, water, etc. Because these are nations which are very close to each other, have a lot of common linkages, but even then, connectivity is lagging. The only talks of connectivity that we have had are on bilateral platforms. 
such as a BBIN, where we had talked about having a common connectivity between Bhutan, Bangladesh, India, and Nepal. But on the BIMSTEC level, as such, there has not been such a program, even though. The connectivity plan has been supported by the Asian Development Bank, so finance would not really be an issue. But it is just that the nations have just not been given a lot of importance to BIMSTEC as of now. The author says that the responsibility of taking BIMSTEC forward and ensuring that it meets its goals lies with the original members, the members that have much more economic power as compared to others. India. That is the single largest state in South Asia, Thailand, because Thailand is in a very important position as being a common member of South Asia also and Southeast Asia also. Among these nations, as you know, apart from Myanmar, which does not have a very strong economy, Thailand is one country which is a member of BIMSTEC also, and it's a member of the ASEAN also. And the third responsibility, as per the author, lies with Bangladesh, which is also one of the founding members of BIMSTEC and has the secretariat of BIMSTEC as well. Now there is one very interesting fact that I would like to throw out for all of you to consider. This is not written by any author, but this is just an observation that I have made. Whenever you see any group where India is a single largest member, now there can be many groups of those kind. SARC is an example. The other example is BIMSTEC. The other example of this region only is a Mekong Ganga group. In all these groups, the one common fact is that India is the single largest member. Whenever such is the case, those groups usually do not have a lot of achievements, because for such groupings, the onus and the responsibility of taking the group forward lies on the single largest member, which is where India has been lagging, as can be seen from multiple examples. I am really hoping that I will be proved wrong with BIMSTEC in the coming years, but till now the track record shows that this is the case with every such grouping. As I said, the 14 sectors where countries will be focusing have now been cut down to seven, and this is how those have been divided. India has been given the responsibility of security, which includes counterterrorism, transnational crime, disaster management, energy. Nepal, for example, has been given the responsibility of ensuring people-to-people -people contact. Some responsibility with Sri Lanka, Thailand, Myanmar, Bhutan, Bangladesh, etc. Now, as I said, just a few weeks back, we had the BIMSTEC summit at Colombo. It was a summit that India had requested to be held online because we did not want to share the same stage as the military leaders of Myanmar who were involved in a military coup. This Colombo summit resulted in a lot of very very important announcements that have been seen as a positive sign in the times to come. For example, BIMSTEC now has an international personality. It now has an emblem. It also has an official flag as well. Also, as I said, the 14 sectors have been curtailed to seven segments, with India being given the responsibility of the security pillar. The sides also talked about a master plan for transport connectivity, with the hope that it will be converted into reality in the future. Some of the other agreements were also talked about, including treaty on mutual legal assistance on criminal matters, memorandum of association on establishment of BIMSTEC technology transfer facility in Sri Lanka, and India, being the biggest member state of the group, announced. That we will be giving one million dollars to increase the operational budget of the BIMSTEC summit at Dhaka. So this is a good sign since India is taking the leadership position and putting its foot forward. For India specifically, BIMSTEC holds a lot of importance. A lot of people have said that BIMSTEC for India can be a great alternative for SARC. SARC was a group where India was hoping to prove its leadership capability. And was hoping to ensure that this entire region remains a peaceful and cooperative region, but because of the presence of Pakistan, the SARC has not really been able to function properly with no frequent summits and a lot of disruptions. That is why India has been looking for an alternative to SARC, and in BIMSTEC we may have found one. BIMSTEC not only connects South and Southeast Asia, it also connects the ecologies of the Great Himalayan and the Bay of Bengal. This is also in line with India's neighborhood first and the Act East or the Look East policy, as you call it. About 30 crore people, or about one fourth of India's population, lives in the states which share a border with the Bay of Bengal: Andhra Pradesh, Odisha, Tamil Nadu, and West Bengal.
it's an extremely strategic area since it is very very close to the malacca straits which is a key strategic point for international trade for india as well it also gives a chance to india to keep an eye on the expansion activities of china in this region so all in all it is extremely important that india makes a good use of the bimstek summit the next article that we have here is based on supreme court's very recent judgment about the rights of the sex workers in india we had discussed this topic a few days back in our big news video also and i really hope that all of you followed this this is just an explainer on the same topic and the present situation that we have the author here says that the supreme court recently said that the sex workers and their children cannot be deprived of their right to life with dignity and human decency now the author here is trying to tell what exactly does the government think about the supreme court verdict now let me give you a very brief background it was in 2011 that a case had come to the supreme court regarding the sex workers in 2011 thus the supreme court had formed a committee the committee was asked to give recommendations about how to improve the lives of the sex workers in india now this committee had given about 10 recommendations out of which the government did not really accept half of them that is why the supreme court again has to revisit the matter and ask the government to implement those recommendations as well this is the shorter version of the story now we'll discuss what exactly were the recommendations where the government had a problem now the first recommendation of this committee that the government of india did not like was that the police should not take any criminal action against a sex worker who is an adult and is participating with consent the supreme court had said that if anyone is indulging in sex work as a profession and they are doing it with their own consent then the police should not take any criminal action against them also the word sex worker is not defined under the immoral traffic prevention act of 1956 the law does define the word prostitution as sexual exploitation or abuse of persons for commercial purposes but the word abuse can have a lot of meanings so as long as a person is taking part in the sexual activity with his or her consent that should not be interpreted as abuse so sex workers are not equal to prostitution this is what the supreme court had said and the government does not really seem to be in line with this thus there is a need to define the term sexual exploitation and the abuse of persons clearly in the law so that there is no scope of any misinterpretation the other recommendation that the government of india did not like which was given by the committee was that voluntary sex work is not illegal and only running a brothel is unlawful so what happens is in reality whenever the police or any agencies raid any brothel in those brothels they find a lot of sex workers and a lot of them are then forcefully jailed or then they are exploited by the authorities now the supreme court and the panel formed by the supreme court has said that whenever the police raids a brothel they must understand that the people who are running the brothel they are the ones who are the culprits they should be taken into custody but the sex workers who are in the brothel with their own consent they should not be harassed by the police because voluntary sex work is not illegal if the brothel is exploiting or abusing these sex workers then they should be held responsible but if in a brothel raid some sex workers are found who are living there with their own consent then they should not be harassed by the police the government here also does not really seem to be in line with what the supreme court panel had said now the law that we have in india right now does not mandate any separation of a child from the mother now what happens is whenever the authorities raid such a brothel a lot of times children of sex workers are also found in such brothels and in many of these cases these children are then separated from the sex workers who are then sent to jail in fact in many of these cases even these children face action under the law the panel had said that this should not happen these children are innocent and no action should be taken against them they should not be booked under the juvenile justice act of the government of india the law right now in india is that carrying on sex work outside notified areas or at a distance of 200 meters from any place of public religion worship education institution hospital etc is not punishable under the law again only as long as it is being done with consent 
there is no abuse and there is no exploitation that is happening then it is legal thus the government would have to differentiate between the sex workers who are doing this voluntarily and prostitution this has to be kept in mind and only and only then we can be able to and only and only then we would be able to stop the exploitation of people who are involved in sex work as their profession the government can use this opportunity to improve the living condition of sex workers now let's think of it from the government's point of view a lot of times it may happen that the government might want to make certain laws let's say for sex workers in improvement of their life or for other topics but the government does not do that for various reasons number 1 the government might think that the society right now is not open enough and such kind of a laws will not be accepted in the society because they would think that the government is favoring something that should not be allowed secondly the government may believe that they are not a big vote bank so taking any drastic action that can lead to such a big debate is not worth the risk so we should not do it but now that the supreme court has said this it can actually give an excuse to the government now government can introduce such a law and can even tell the people that it is because of the supreme court that we are introducing this law so the author is thinking from that point of view that it actually presents an opportunity for the government to do something good for the sex workers and they won't even have to take the blame because it is a supreme court of india that had actually set the government to do this now as i said in the beginning this recent supreme court ruling is not because of something that happened just now it actually goes back to an old case let me tell you what that case was so in 2007 actually the calcutta high court had upheld life imprisonment of a person who was found guilty of murdering a sex worker in kolkata now this person then filed an appeal in the supreme court in 2010 in 2011 the supreme court upheld the verdict of the calcutta high court and said that yes the person should be given life imprisonment now the supreme court in this case said that we are also concerned about the living situation of the sex workers and we want to take some action so supreme court converted the case itself into a pil and they formed a panel in which they appointed senior advocates pradeep ghosh jayan bhushan and an ngo called usha multipurpose cooperative society and darbar mahila samanvay committee and roshni academy these together were asked to give a recommendation to the supreme court and to the government to make suitable suggestions to prevent human trafficking rehabilitation of sex workers etc now it was this panel that came out with a report in 2016 this panel had noted that the sex workers have a very difficult time in proving their identity because they don't really have identity cards such as ration cards voter cards etc so they don't really get benefits of government schemes the supreme court then had said to the government that they should ensure that even without these ration card etc the government benefits are given to the sex workers including the opening up of the bank accounts the supreme court had asked the government of india to implement the other recommendations given by this panel as well this was back in 2016 now over these years the supreme court was closely monitoring if the government has actually implemented the recommendations or not and now in may 2022 the supreme court remembered that yes the government is not accepting these recommendation and that is why they had to decide something on this matter so on may 19 the supreme court said that under the powers given to us by article 142 we are directing the government of india to make changes in the law and improve the living conditions of the sex workers in india they had said that the 10 recommendation of the panel have to be accepted by the government but only 6 of them have been accepted with 4 the government has a problem the 4 that we just discussed about what to do with brothels about the police not being able to take action against sex workers etc the supreme court had said that we have given you enough time and you are not making changes in the law now we are hearing the matter again and we are asking the government to take the action and accept the recommendations of this panel so this is the background story of the entire verdict given by the supreme court the next article that we have here is about the ugc's new approval for the local indian universities to collaborate with the foreign universities now in simple terms what the university grants commission has done is they have made it easier for indian universities to collaborate with foreign universities to offer joint degrees dual degrees or twinning programs as such 
earlier also there was a provision for this but it was only through taking specific permissions from UGC on a case to case basis but now no permissions are to be taken from the UGC if certain conditions are met the conditions are that if the Indian higher education institution is accredited by the national assessment and accreditation council with a minimum score of 3.01 out of 4 they can collaborate with international institutions now the other condition is if they are featuring in top 1000 of the times higher education or the QS world university rankings which are very very famous then also they can collaborate this is the eligibility criteria for Indian institutions for foreign institutions their eligibility criteria is that they have to be under this top 1000 the other criteria for Indian institutions is that the education ministry also publishes certain rankings under the NIRF called the National Institute Ranking Framework. If they are in top 100 of that list, then also these universities can take up such collaboration. So if the Indian University and the foreign universities fulfill this particular criteria, they can go ahead and form their collaboration without taking permission from the UGC, which is a good point. However, the sad part as per the author here is that UGCs are still not open to allowing such collaborations when it comes to open and distance learning programs, which is a sad reality. Even the national education policy had suggested that the government of India should give a push to open and distance learning programs to improve the enrollments in higher education institutions in India. These programs are usually much cheaper as compared to full-time classroom programs and they are taken by people who want to upgrade their skills, who want to switch to better jobs or earn more money. Thus, it is in favor of those students that you should offer these programs with collaboration with foreign universities as well. In fact, the government of India itself has initiated programs such as a Swayam MOOC in the past so that we can get more people to learn online. So it is surprising why UGC has not allowed the same when it comes to collaborating with the foreign universities. India sees a lot of foreign students coming to our universities, especially from the neighboring countries, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, etc. If we have to increase their enrollment also, the Indian universities should be allowed to collaborate with the foreign universities even in open and distance learning programs. It will ensure that our higher education institutions can actually increase their enrollment, earn more money and India can also in turn earn more foreign exchange. So it's a win-win for everyone. So the author here is hoping that the UGC will take this suggestion into consideration in the coming days. Now the UGC regulations that we just talked about are very recent. The earlier UGC regulations were actually given in 2016. Let me tell you what are the differences between those. As we discussed, in the earlier regulations, the main difference was that there was no automatic method of these foreign collaborations. On a case-to-case -case basis, the universities had to go to UGC and ask for permission. But now, minimum rankings have been given that if the institutions qualify as per these minimum rankings, they can go ahead and have their collaborations. Thus, the red tapeism had decreased considerably. The final decision now can be taken much easier. Earlier, a lot of factors were actually considered and at the end of the day, the UGC had the decision to take a decision on each and every case. Now, all that has changed. Now, how exactly will these courses, the dual degree, joint degree, etc. be offered? So, the process is, for example, for the twin degree program, where you get degree of both the institutions, a student can get up to 30% course credit utilization from total course from the foreign university and the rest you can take from your university. The two universities have to make sure that their curriculum and the courses are not clashing so that the student does not have to learn the same thing again in India and in foreign universities. This will give a lot of exposure to the Indian students from the best faculties, the best education system from not just India, but also from well-known universities across the world. The next article that we have here is about the Surrogacy Act. Now, the reason why this article is in the news or the reason why this article has been written here is, recently there was a case, there was a female petitioner that went to the Delhi High Court. She already has a child. She wanted another child, but through surrogacy only. 
She said that my first experience of having a child was very traumatic and I do not want to go through that experience again. Also, I'm a working lady, so I cannot compromise that. So I want to have a second child, but only through surrogacy. But the permission was denied. The reason is that as per the surrogacy act that we have in India, there are only certain conditions under which surrogacy is allowed. One of those conditions is that it has to be on the medical grounds only. So if there's a married woman who is capable of having his or her child, then you would not be allowed to have surrogacy. This is why the Surrogacy Act is in the news. Now, the Surrogacy Act kicked in from Jan this year, which lays down all these rules. As per these rules, only certain people are allowed to offer surrogacy. For example, only married couples can opt for it. And the Act defines married couples as married Indian man and women. So it does not include homosexual people. It does not include man, man or women, women couples. It does not even include singles. It only includes married Indian man and women who are considered as a couple. It also has given an age criteria. The women should be 23 to 50 years, while the man should be 26 to 55 years. The couple should not have a child of their own. Also, the law says that if single women want to have surrogacy, there are certain conditions that they have to fulfill. First, the women should be a widow or a divorcee. The age should be between 35 and 45. And single men, on the other hand, are not allowed to have surrogacy under this particular law. One of the most important points, however, about the new law is that it only allows altruistic surrogacy. Now, let me tell you what this means. So what had happened in the past few years is that in foreign nations, mainly in the Western nations, when a couple had a medical issue and they were not able to have their own child, they used to search for surrogates. And developing nations such as India had become the hubs of surrogacy. So foreign couples used to come to India, find someone through the middlemen and pay the women some money and ask the women to be a surrogate mother to carry the child of that couple for nine months. And then once the child is born, hand it over to the couple. This was kind of an illegal trade that was running and thriving in India. However, there were a lot of issues with that. Issues such as a lot can happen in between these nine months. For example, the couple who had opted for surrogacy they got separated, they got divorced in middle of these nine months and now they did not want the child. It actually happened in 2008 when a Japanese couple had found a surrogate mother in Gujarat but they were separated in between the nine month period and now they did not want the child. The same actually happened with an Australian couple. So at that point of time, how does the responsibility of the child come to the surrogate mother? That is a problem. These surrogate mothers usually come from very poor backgrounds and they are ready to rent their womb just in exchange for money. It has also happened that after a child is born and has certain medical complications, the parents refuse to take the child. Because of this, there has long been a demand that we should either ban surrogacy in India completely or we should have a proper law to regulate this so that women who are actually taking part in surrogacy are not exploited. Thus, the law says that only altruistic surrogacy is allowed, meaning that surrogacy can only be done if the person who is a surrogate mother is doing it out of compassion and no monetary benefits can be given to the mother. The mother will only be given medical expenses and insurance coverage and no other monetary benefits can be given. So if you are doing it out of your free will, if you're doing it because you want the parents to have the child only and only then you can go ahead, but there will be no exchange of money. Not just this, the surrogate mother, the female who is actually ready to do this has to be a close relative of the couple. So it cannot be anyone. It has to be a close relative of the couple. Also, the couples who actually want to undergo this surrogacy process, they also would have to take certificates from the authorities, which are called Certificate of Essentiality and Certificate of Eligibility. Thus, a lot of stringent regulations have now been put into place. Also, one person can become a surrogate mother only once in her lifetime and the lady should have been married, should have a child of her own and must be between the age of 25 and 35. Thus, a lot of stringent provisions have been put into place. However, there are some issues with the law as well. The first biggest issue as we discussed in the beginning was that it does not allow the surrogacy procedure for single women, for men 
for gay couples etc it is only allowed for married man and women as a couple and single women who is either a widow or a divorcee thus a lot of people have been excluded from this particular law and that is why this is still being criticized by a lot of people also when we talk about such kind of procedures you might have also heard about something called art assisted reproductive technology now i want to clarify here that surrogacy and art are very different surrogacy usually means and then it is placed in the womb of a third person so the couple is separate and there is a third person a woman whose womb is being used in surrogacy so she is the one who carries the child in art it is just the couple who is involved there is no third person who is involved also ART has much simpler regulation it has much simpler procedure the ART procedures are open to married couples even live in partners single women and even foreigners in india while for surrogacy we just discussed there are much more stringent laws a lot of foreigners still visit india for the ART facilities as per the health ministry there are over 40000 clinics in india that actually give the services of ART The growth of the ART clinics in India is said to be one of the highest in the entire world. The ART includes all the techniques that attempt to obtain a pregnancy by handling the sperm and the oocyte outside the human body, then transferring the gamete and the embryo into the reproductive system of a woman. Usually, the ART does not involve a third person, while surrogacy does. The next article that we have here is a topic that we did discuss just a few days back, but there has been a development in this regard. If you remember a few days back we had discussed that the government of India specifically the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology has released a draft the draft said that over and above the IT rules of 2021 which said that the social media companies like Facebook etc have to put in place a grievance officer who will take complaints against their content over and above that the government is planning to make their own appellate committee and we did discuss the same for example if i have an issue with the content posted on facebook i can complain to facebook but if i lose the case i will still be allowed to go to this committee of the government who will take the final call about whether or not the content will remain or it will be removed from facebook what has happened is that the government of india within a day of releasing this draft has taken it back so the draft that said that the government will make this appellate committee has now been withdrawn by the government because of a lot of debate and criticism of that we had also discussed this earlier about how this committee will give so much powers to the government to regulate each and everything on social media anything against the government anything against the ruling party or politicians will be struck down because this committee will be controlled by the government that is why this was criticized now Although we have discussed the entire topic earlier just a few days back what i want to discuss here is that we often think that it is only our government that is doing something like this trying to regulate social media trying to see what is going online or not but the fact is that that is not true a lot of nations around the world and even the developed nations liberal countries democracies are also doing the same because social media companies have become so huge and so powerful as a method of taking your voice to millions and millions of people that the governments now are having to regulate it for example if you remember a few years back there was this unfortunate shooting in new zealand that shooting was actually telecasted live on facebook by the shooter and this is not the first time that this has happened that is why countries around the world are now taking action to regulate social media let me give you some examples germany passed this law in 2018 that applied to companies having more than 2 million registered users in germany under this law the government of germany had red flagged certain content that could not be paid a fine of 2 million euros for under reporting illegal activities on their platform australia also passed a similar kind of a law in 2019 where they introduce criminal penalties on social media platforms such as facebook instagram etc if they do not abide by the law of the land they did it specifically because of the live streaming of the shootings of new zealand that we just talked about which took place on the facebook platform then there are nations such as russia and china but with these nations you do expect such kind of regulations in fact china has banned 
websites such as Twitter, Google, WhatsApp, they have their own versions of each of these. And China, in fact, has a very, very big cyber police whose lone responsibility is to ensure that such kind of a content, specifically anything against the Chinese government and the policies followed by the Chinese government does not remain online and it is taken out immediately. Thus, do understand that because the tech companies and the social media organizations are becoming so huge, such steps are being taken by nations across the world and not just India. These are the important articles from the Hindu newspaper today. Now a couple of practice questions. Number one, there's a fine line between government's regulations of social media and government's restrictions on free speech. Discuss. Second, how does the surrogacy law in India aim to handle surrogacy related problems in the country? Elaborate. Both these questions have to be answered within 250 words each. Thank you so much for watching the video.